Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of the Society of Women Engineers, Elizabeth Bierman. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the SWE Board of Directors, I welcome each of you to Los Angeles, California for WE14, the annual conference of the Society of Women Engineers. I also welcome you to our opening keynote and breakfast. This morning's event is generally sponsored by Eaton Corporation and Genetech. Our keynote this morning, Gwen Shotwell, really takes our conference theme this year, a global exchange for change, to galactic heights, and I mean that literally. Gwen's company, SpaceX, headquarters in nearby Hawthorne, California, is the world's fastest growing provider of space launch services and since its founding has launched over 50 rockets into space. These missions have accounted for both commercial satellite launches as well as NASA missions. More to come from Gwen in a little bit. But before we kick off, I would like to offer a few thank yous. Of course, behind every outstanding conference are teams of hardworking SWE volunteer leaders. I would like to take a moment to recognize these groups, starting with our board. Would the FY15 Board of Directors please stand to be recognized? And SWE's Conference Advisory Board, chaired by Maggie Austin, is responsible for setting the tone and objectives for all of SWE's conferences. Thank you for your insights and efforts that have led to this amazing conference. Would all Conference Advisory Board members please stand to be recognized. And last night at our social, the Los Angeles Host Committee Chair Laura Greener welcomed us to their world-class city. A large number of volunteers from the Los Angeles area and from throughout SWE have and will continue to work during this conference to make this awarding and a memorable event for all of us. I ask the members of the Los Angeles Host Committee and all of our volunteers to please stand and let us offer our thanks for your hard work and commitment. And hopefully you have all seen and heard that WE14 is hosting ICWIS 16, the annual conference for the International Network of Women Engineers and Scientists, or INWIS. We are thrilled to be the host of INWIS 16 conference as it's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Attendees will see and hear the recurring theme, a global exchange for change over the next few days, and we hope this resonates with you as you attend all of the week's educational sessions and events. The global presence of this week has been and will be amazing. The global presence this week has over 42 countries represented, and I encourage you all to take full advantage. Now to say a few words, it is my distinct honor to welcome to the stage the president of INWIS, Dr. Kan Ju Lee. guests, colleagues, and participants. I'm so pleased to share some remarks with all of you at the EQUES 16, Society of Women Engineers National Conference V14. On behalf of INWEST, the International Network of Women Engineers and Scientists, I'd like to express my heartful welcome to all of you joining us for over 42 countries to Los Angeles to participate in this important joint meeting. I'm so proud to be holding the 16th EQUEST meeting organized by SWE. We are also excited because EQUEST 16 celebrates the 50th year. Since the first EQUEST in 1964, which was also hosted by SWE in New York in USA. In West, will celebrate the half centennial of EQUEST by archiving the documents of EQUEST's her story, which will be demonstrated in International Lounge. You can see over there. 
I'd like to express my sincere appreciation uh, to the president of SWE, Elizabeth Spearman, for hosting Equest 16, and Gail Masson as the organizing chair of Equest 16, all the members of the organizing committee ho for hosting and preparing for Equest 16. I also like to thank all members and board members of SWE and INUES for collaborating each other for Equest 16. The International Network of Women Engineers and Scientists, INUES, is the international network body serving as an NGO, a partner of UNESCO. INUES was created with a vision to build a better future worldwide through the full and effective participation of women and girls in all aspects of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. INUES oversees the triennial EQUEST conference and the regional conferences in the two intervening years when there is no EQUEST. The EQUEST has been held almost every three years in various parts of, of the world for supporting women in engineers and science since 1964. Equest 15 was held successfully in 2011 in Adelaide, Australia. Since then, we had two regional conferences in New Delhi in India 2012 and Nairobi, Kenya in 2013. One goal of INRES is to establish a regional network to foster and promote its activities in physically very close and similar time zone region because they have common interests as well as regional problems that can be solved together. The Asia Pacific Nation Network, APNN, was first regional network established at Equest 15. Since then, we have had three APNN meeting in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, hosted by WSET in 2012, in Taipei, Taiwan, organized by TWIST in 2013, and in Seoul, Korea by KWSE in 2014, this summer. The second regional network is just, just start being started is the Africa Regional Network, ARN. It will, it's officially established during this, this Equest 16 as a second regional network. These regional conferences and regional networks of INWEST are specifically planned and organized to orga accommodate as many women scientists and engineers as possible and to provide venue so that they benefit from the international network. We gather again after three years under the theme Global Exchange for Change in the global city of Los Angeles. We are sure to experience bi-directional diversity. International members will experience well-organized SWE spirit, and SWE members will learn about the many unique effort and cultures of women in STEM worldwide. At Equest 16, we will share our experience, our passions, our times, our energies, and our ideas, and care for each other, and learn from one another, which will empower us, women scientists and engineers. We hope this world becomes safer by being faithful to the basics. We hope this world is more peaceful by pursuing collaboration rather than competition. We hope this world is sustainable by producing new knowledge. We hope this world is gender equal place by strengthening the crooked things. We hope this world is rich enough to keep the next generation growing for their hopeful life by sharing our resources. We look for, forward to all being inspired, having a great and meaningful time here at Equest 16 and we 14 by opening our hearts and reaching hands out and enjoy the city of angels. Thank you very much. Best wishes all.
Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, and we are very excited to be hosting ICWIS this year. This morning's keynote would not be possible without the support of our two sponsors. Our first sponsor, Eaton Corporation, recognizes that diversity fuels the innovation that leads to safe, reliable, efficient, and sustainable power management solutions. Please welcome to the stage Jay Eyinger, VP of Engineering from Eaton Aerospace. Very happy to be here, very excited to be here. Um, when I drove in from, drove into LA last night, um, it occurred to me that um, I am a minority in a minority. So first of all, I'm an engineer. Um, I'm a female engineer. I'm a female mechanical engineer. And I'm a female mechanical engineer who has stayed in engineering all her career. And that's a very small number. And actually, that is exactly the problem. So um, when you look at universities today, about 18% of uh, university female students go into engineering, about 2% go into mechanical engineering, you know? And among the 18%, about 11% stay and pursue engineering careers. So as women, we are very underrepresented in engineering field as a whole. And, and why is that a problem, right? So, if you think about it, a lot of the advancements that are happening in the world, in any area you take a look at, is happening because of engineering. You know, engineering is making such a big impact in technology, uh, things that are changing our society and our lives. And um, about 50% of the world's population being women, uh, we, are, we, are, we owe it to ourselves to have a voice or be, you know, have our perspective in the engineering field, right? So things can only get better with the diversity of thought, uh, especially with women engineers being a part of the workforce and continuing that, you know, trying to change the world and trying to change the society. So uh, organizations such as Society of Women Engineers are doing exactly that, helping advance the cause of women in engineering, you know, pursue engineering careers from school and also stay and providing career opportunities and networking opportunities. And Eaton Corporation is very proud to be a, a partner with the Society of Women Engineers and we, be very happy to be hosting this event today. Um, the, the women need encouragement, girls need encouragement through the K through 12. Um, you know, talk about it's okay to be really smart, it's okay to be smart at mathematics and science. Um, they need mentors that would pursue them to pursue engineering careers. And uh, organizations such as we, who help opportunities and networking and career opportunities, and employers who would value diversity and who value a diverse way of thinking and, and diverse way of problem solving, right? At the end of the day, engineering is nothing but you know, complex problem solving, and we take a lot of pride in doing that. So speaking of problem solving, Eaton Corporation is very proud to take on one of the toughest problems in the world, power management. So I'd like to show you a short video um, of what Eden Corporation is and what we do. There are companies that generate power and others that deliver it. But Eaton is different. We help companies like yours manage power. In fact, Eaton is a leading power management company. We help the world use electrical, fluid and mechanical power more reliably, efficiently, safely and sustainably. Frankly, we can't think of a more important business to be in today. Because the world's demand for power is growing every day, but the world's resources are not. So by improving the way the world manages power, the more power we'll have to improve the world. That's the big picture, of course. Eaton delivers on that promise across a growing number of industries. We help make the buildings you live and work in smarter, safer, and consume less electricity. We help to reduce the environmental impact and rising operating costs of planes, trucks, trains, autos, and commercial vehicles. We help industrial equipment and machinery deliver greater power and productivity using less energy. 
we help keep vast rivers of digital information flowing without draining the world's power reservoirs. We drive progress and bolster local economies by helping to build more reliable, efficient, and safer infrastructure. At the same time, we're helping to uncover new sources of power, too. From capturing traditional energy sources more safely and efficiently, to transforming alternative energy into everyday energy. That combination of global resources and local responsiveness has helped us to build strong customer relationships and deliver consistently strong results. Something else you should know, everywhere Eaton does business, we're committed to doing business right. From the ethical standards of our people, to the environmental stewardship of our facilities, to the local support we provide to the communities in which we live and work. So we are a, a large corporation. Uh, we are in 175 countries, 103,000 employees. And we are a technology company. And I belong to the Aeros I run the engineering and technology for aerospace division. Um, we are about 10,000 engineers strong. Um, the good news is the leader of 10,000 engineers is here with you today, and he'll be participating in a panel. If I were you, I'd prepare some really difficult questions to ask him. But um, anyway, thank you, and uh, you know, make the most of today. Uh, do the networking. Um, you know, get to meet with companies, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully enjoy the rest of the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Our second sponsor, Genetech, is passionate about helping people with hard-to-treat conditions. We draw inspiration from that spirit of giving as well as the innovative science that brings those solutions to patients around the world. Please welcome Adria Harris, Senior HR Manager from Genetech. Let's go after things that affect a lot of people, where there's a big need, and there isn't anything around that uh, works very well. The days of trial and error where we just treat every patient and wait to see what happens are over. If you don't actually have the guts to take risks, you're not going to make it in this industry. Risk taking is essential to innovation and innovation is live or die in the pharmaceutical industry. The molecules that we're testing that we've designed have never been tested before, have never been invented, no one's ever seen them. You have to be the eternal optimist. You have to believe that the next molecule that you make is gonna be the, the, the right one. Our job is to transform that scientific idea into an actual new product. Can we help patients? Can we improve their lives? Is this drug, is this target going to treat the disease? Understanding how to achieve much greater benefits for patients is a real possibility now. This is where the new medicines that are going to make a difference for patients are being created right from the beginning. The chance to really make a difference in the next 20 years is going to be even greater than it has been in the last 20. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Elizabeth, for your introduction. Um, I wanted to start out this morning with just a quick story from this video to show you what Genentech is all about. And as you could see at the end of the video, this is part an excerpt from a longer video that you can see at our website at gene.com. But as you now know, Genentech is about making medicines. And it takes thousands of innovative and talented individuals, such as yourselves, to make these medicines a reality for our patients. Today, several of our women engineers are taking a break from making medicines to join you all here at SWE so we can focus on making connections. And these are connections that will help us learn, network, and be able to further develop ourselves so that we can reach our full potential. It is amazing to be a part of this this morning, and I'm really proud that Genentech is sponsoring this breakfast. I can feel the energy in the room and the excitement 
anticipation for what you're about to experience over the next few days. I'd first like to say, too, that I'm very happy to see that our, our SWE members are taking a break and participating over these next few days, but also giving back by sharing with you things that they've learned and experienced in their own careers. As you heard in the video, Making Medicines is about taking a risk. It's about being an eternal optimist and also having the chance to make a difference. And I propose that you can draw a parallel to these phrases to developing your own career. I personally have benefited from working for Genentech for over the past 15 years, being given the opportunity to work on the manufacturing production floor, set strategy and supply chain, support our head of technical development, who was a part of that video as her chief of staff, and now be a leader in our HR organization. It helps to work for a company that was ranked number six in best places to work last year. But more importantly, I don't think I could have gotten to where I am today without taking a few risks, being optimistic, and also furthering my desire to make a difference. But even more so, it's about nurturing those relationships and connections that I've made throughout my career. So if I can leave you with one note for today and the rest of this week, take the time to network build those connections, even just one, because you just never know where that may lead to help you further your development and reach your full potential. So thank you and enjoy this breakfast and the rest of the week. Thank you, Adria. It is now time for me to welcome our guest of honor and keynote speaker. Gwen Shotwells joined SpaceX in 2002 as the seventh employee. Today, she manages the operations of the $5 billion company who employs over 3,000 people. Prior to joining SpaceX, Gwen spent more than 10 years at the Aerospace Corporation. There, she held positions in space systems engineering and technology, as well as project management. She was promoted to the role of chief engineer of an MLV class satellite program and managed a landmark study for the Federal Aviation Administration on commercial space transportation and completed an extensive analysis of space policy for NASA's future investment in space transportation. In addition, Ms. Shotwell participates in a variety of STEM-related programs, including the Frank J. Red Student Scholarship Competition. And under her leadership, the committee has raised more than $350,000 in scholarships in the last six years. Shatwa was named winner of the 2011 World Technology Award for Individual Achievement in Space, and in June 2012, she was inducted into the Women in Technology International Hall of Fame. She is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Space Security and serves as an advisor for the Art and Technology Incubator at the Los Angeles County of Museum of Art. Now we will see a short video on SpaceX. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off of the Falcon 9. Falcon 9 has cleared the tower. Starting pitch kick. We have the power systems are not on. Dragon's lower rated limit. They're initiating the capture of the dragon. Standing by. Capture is confirmed. Houston station looks like we got us a dragon by the tail. I 
I spent quite a bit of time poking around in here this morning, just looking at the engineering and the layout, and I'm very pleased. So flying up in a, a human-rated Dragon is uh, not going to be an issue. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage President and COO of SpaceX, Gwen Shotwell. I love that video. I know, if that doesn't get you excited about engineering, yeah, I don't know what will. That's I am biased, though. I'm an aerospace engineer, so. So Gwen and I are just going to spend the next, you know, half hour, 45 minutes just having a discussion. I have a few questions prepared for her, but we really would like to encourage you as well, if you have any questions for Gwen, uh, to tweet hashtag AskGwen, and we'll do our best to get to those as well. But Gwen, I mean, it's an honor to have you here. This is our largest keynote uh, breakfast that we've had for, for our SWE conference. So thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Actually, I owe a lot to the Society of Women Engineers. Um, if you don't mind, no, I'd like me, you to. Let me tell you my flaky story on uh, how I became an engineer, or how I decided to become an engineer. Um, I was a great student in high school. I didn't have a lot of direction, though. I was good in all my classes. Uh, but my mother, who was an artist, uh, suggested that I become an engineer. By the way, this was in the late 70s. I thought, engineer? You know, don't they drive trains? I don't want to drive a train. <laughs> Not a joke, by the way. Um, and so she took me to a Society of Women Engineers event at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And I was, I really admired the mechanical engineer that sat on that panel. And uh, I loved her suit. And <laughs> not, not a joke, I'm not exaggerating, the years have not, uh, have not changed this story. And uh, it caused me, to, I was comfortable with her, I loved clothes at the time too. And I went up and I asked her about her suit and what she did and she owned her own company. And uh, she really inspired me. And that day, I said, okay, mom, you can get off my back. I will be a mechanical engineer. And that was oh, it. That's very cool. I was 15. That's very cool. Yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. Um, so SpaceX is in the headlines every day. And I know you just won a big contract. But what is the coolest part of your job? This is going to sound pretty, uh, well, it's going to sound pretty schleppy. But uh, really, I work with the, the finest engineers. Uh, and technicians that I have uh, ever in my career. I, I think SpaceX is the most extraordinary company. And I get to work with these folks every day, and every day they create miracles, and every day we do awesome things. So that's, mm -hmm. that's most definitely the best part of my job. What were you thinking when you took the role as the seventh employee for SpaceX? Yeah, th that's kind of a funny story, too. So um, I had been in the aerospace industry for quite some time uh, when, I, when I took this role, almost 15 years. And I think all the early SpaceXers, you could characterize them as very experienced in the industry uh, and frustrated with uh, uh, the lack of innovation and the really slow pace. Um, and uh, it was kind of a hard decision. I had a pretty comfortable job. Uh, at the time, but I thought, you know, if, if SpaceX can't make it work, this industry just doesn't excite me, and I don't think it excites many uh, to go into it. So this would be my last job in the mm -hmm. aerospace industry. If, if Elon and SpaceX couldn't make it work, I was happy to go sell real estate or barista <laughs> at a Starbucks. That would have been okay, too. But thankfully, it did work, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not a barista. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a lot of collegiates in the audience. Do you want to describe what your first college level engineering course was, especially maybe not knowing what mechanical engineers did when so, you went in? I don't remember which was my first, but I can remember kind of the seminal course. It was three-dimensional rotational rigid body dynamics. All right, anybody? <laughs> um, hardest professor at the engineering school. I went to Northwestern. We have any cats here? Well done. Um, hardest professor, uh, Dr. Walker. I was scared to death of this class. Um, but for whatever reason, about 
ha about half, maybe a third of the way through, I didn't do well on the first midterm, um, but about a third of the way through, it just clicked for me, and I got it, um, and I got the highest grade on the final. I think when Dr. Walker handed it to me, he kind of was surprised, like, this is you, really? <laughs> All right, but, uh, and that was really it. That really settled it up and firmed it up for me. I was, uh, I was comfortable in the career, uh, or in the curriculum, and uh, I knew I could do it. Good, good. But research does show that a lot of women um, leave engineering in the first few years of their career. Why do you think that is, and what has encouraged you to persist? I didn't actually know that okay. until I, you sent me these questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't. I mean, I knew the, the, the percentages of female in, in engineering was, you know, appalling. Um, but I didn't know that they didn't stick with it. Uh, so I thought about it last night. And, you know, I, I don't have any answers that are based on, you know, any knowledge. Uh, but, you know, I could guess. And maybe it's because women don't really know what engineering is. Mm -hmm. uh, courses in engineering are very different from day to day. And uh, maybe they go into it and say, you know, it's not quite what I thought and not what I expected. Um, so I, so if, and if that's the reason, then obviously we need to make sure that women uh, participate in engineering projects, solar car, uh, formula SAE, mm -hmm. uh, basically, so right. you know what, uh, what to expect when you go into engineering. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's such an awesome career. Mm -hmm. You know, you get to create things and build things and make the world a better place. So. Um, I'm sure women want to do that. I don't think that's not on the agenda. Right. Anything in your first few roles that really inspired you that said, this is the career for me? Um, that's interesting. And now I think I just kind of stuck with it until mm -hmm. I found the right place for me in engineering. I'm an, I'm an analyst. I am not a builder. I'm not a good hardware person. I could make a Xerox machine break just by walking by it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, and I, I happened to find a really great job at Aerospace Corporation. I was a thermal analyst in the uh, satellite thermal department. And that was really, that was great yeah. for me. I was analyzing satellite temperatures. Uh, and, and it just was a good fit yeah, for me. That's good. Yeah, for my, for my own experience, I had a really encouraging manager my first role out of college. And, you know, he gave me challenging, um, um, challenging projects to work on, but he um, didn't set me up to fail. He was very encouraging. Um, back then, mentorship wasn't a word we used a lot, but I believe he was a good mentor for me, you know, and encouraged me to, to continue to stay, and I think that's why I did. So I think we all have our own, you know, unique reasons why we stay. Um, so we've focused heavily in our organization on balancing work pursuits with um, time outside of the office. And this year was the first year SWE uh, put out an ebook called Work-Life Integration. So what type of work-life balance programs does SpaceX have in place, and how have you personally benefited from these? So, you know, we are not known for uh, a strong work-life balance at SpaceX. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that would be an area for opportunity for improvement <laughs> at SpaceX. We can um, help you with that. You know, <laughs> you know, I think I have almost 100 SpaceX women here today. They, they might be a little better. Yay. <laughs> um, they might have some great ideas as well. Um, I, call, I don't say work-life balance. I, you know, or balance to me is not 50-50. Balance means it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have been incredibly lucky. Uh, my, uh, my children, children, you know, my daughter's 19 and my son is going to be 18 next month. Um, and they're such awesome kids. They did not, they were not high maintenance. These are the kids that, you know, would come home and run up to their rooms and do their homework without beating on them. They weren't great at their chores, but they've always gotten A's. So that was their job. That was their chores to get A's. Um, so, you know, I didn't, I was there for them, but I, I you know, I, I could focus on work as well at home. So I was really lucky with that. So to me, balance is not 50-50, it's just what's sustainable. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, I've been really lucky. And my husband is a workaholic too, so, you know, it works out. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> so when you started SpaceX with just a few employees, and now there's over 3,000, so what have, 
has been the biggest lesson for you with the growth of SpaceX? Yeah, there's uh, rapid, rapid growth is really difficult for companies, especially when you start so small. You know, we were growing 100% year over year a couple years, and then slow years were 50%, and, and now we're at about 30%. Uh, and there's no question that the hardest thing uh, to do is when you're growing that fast is to maintain kind of that super dedicated focus and, f and, and f focus on innovation. Uh, as companies get bigger, they tend to get more lethargic and more bureaucratic. Kind of mm -hmm. by definition, you're you know you're bigger and, and not every I don't know everybody. It's I don't know everybody's name at SpaceX. You know, when we were three or four hundred people, I knew everybody. Um, and so I think people start feeling disconnected from the vision. So there's no question that I think the most important thing as you grow is to communicate. Find effective ways to communicate with your employees so that, first of all, they feel a part of something tremendous. I, I think that's the best way to keep people uh, satisfied with their work experience is to make sure they feel connected, uh, that they, they know what they're supposed to be doing and they feel like they're really contributing. Mm -hmm. okay. So what are you looking for in leaders at SpaceX? You know, I, I think it depends in what particular area of the company, but I mean, generally leaders have to be able to listen uh, to their employees. Uh, leaders need to know where you're headed for sure, uh, so, but, uh, but they need to be able to communicate very strongly with employees, and that's not really something that engineers are known for. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe more now, but uh, you know, in the, in the 80s when, uh, when I became an engineer, you know, you go to the mall and pick them out. You're like, you're an engineer, you're an engineer, you're an engineer. Um, and now the, the, the lines are definitely more blurred. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think you can necessarily characterize engineers as poor communicators now. You certainly could in that time frame. Mm -hmm. But it's really important. It's probably the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Does SpaceX have training programs on better communication? Or is it something that, like the Society of Women Engineers, we try very hard to you know, promote our members to, to be better communicators, and we do that through our leadership opportunities and things? So we, we definitely try to uh, encourage our leadership team, our managers and our leaders to communicate. People are really busy. People mm -hmm. work really hard at SpaceX, and I think that's the first thing that gets kind of yeah. put to the side. Um, it shouldn't be, obviously, the first thing that gets put to the side. Um, but uh, I would characterize that as another opportunity for us yeah. to improve. Okay. <laughs> and I think a lot of companies would agree, you know. Um, so I talked about mentorship a little bit, and I know a lot of our members in the Society of Women Engineers are always um, looking for mentors or wanting to see what the importance of uh, mentorship is. Do you currently mentor anybody right now, and, and why do you do that? So so we don't have a formal mentorship program at SpaceX. Um, however, there's a couple of key ingredients from my perspective. Uh, I have an, an, op an open door policy, frankly, we're all in cubes, so I mean, I have no way of not having people come into my cube. Um, but uh, any employee that wants to talk to me is welcome, uh, either to send me an email, uh, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me, or to, to come and, and see me. Um, I think it's really important that everybody has direct an opportunity for direct communication with mm -hmm. the senior leadership at a company. Um, I try to be explain when I make, you know, a, when I point out a direction or I, or I try to get people to go a specific way. I think it's really important continually to pr provide why. Mm -hmm. You know, we ask people to do really hard things, and, I, and I, it's a lot easier to do if you explain why you need this crazy thing done or why do we need to take this change in direction now. Um, and I, I think that's an important part of mentorship. So access, um, explaining why you make the decisions that you do, um, and, uh, and obviously always providing feedback. I think that's the most important element of, of any men mentorship is, you know, it's not throwing anybody under the bus, but it's pointing out where you feel like uh, employees either made a mistake and how they could correct it. Mm -hmm. So it should be okay. continuous. Okay. And any employee that wants to get at me gets yeah. to. That's good. So. Because I think a lot of times, especially young engineers, um, look up to their leadership and they don't have that open door policy or might not feel like they can just approach them. So it's very encouraging to hear that oh, yeah. you feel like any employee can come to your, your cube. Yeah, so if and there's any lack of clarity there, yeah. any employee <laughs> can come and see me oh, whenever good. you can. That's good, that's yeah. very good. And I think women are um, able to communicate that a little differently than men in which that, you know, we want to be um, team, be involved with teams and we want to collaborate and we want to make the team better. 
And I think you're gonna do that through the communication you talked about, and you're gonna do that by letting people know their strengths and weaknesses and how can we be a better team overall. So that's really great to hear. Um, what is the number one piece of advice you would give to your younger self? You know, I got this asked this question yesterday. I met with our, our current set of interns. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't change almost anything. Uh, I'm not a regretting kind of person. I wouldn't change anything that, that I've done or, or uh, the path that I've taken. But there's no question that uh, I really believe that, you know, every day you should assess how you've done and how you can be better. You know, I, I don't think uh, kind of sitting back and, and, and thinking, okay, you know, I'm doing a good job. I can relax a little bit. So I, I feel like you should be excellent every day. That's good advice. Now, your company has, has a very innovative approach to doing business as usual. And SpaceX has really captured the imagination of the public. And so what is on the horizon for your organization? So we've got um, a number of really key pieces of technology that are uh, strongly linked to our ultimate vision, by the way, and that is to build space transportation systems that allow people to travel to another planet. Mars happens to be the, the closest and best one uh, that we could feasibly get to. Um, so what's key to that? Reusability. Um, for those of you not in the aerospace industry, Maybe you don't know it, but rockets are used once and then thrown away. Um, space shuttle was a little bit unique, although it was refurbished. It, it certainly was not the same shuttle uh, that, that launched again. Um, and you can imagine what the air, airline industry would be like if you tossed an aircraft after its mission from LA to New York. You know, we wouldn't be flying to New York. Um, so it, to facilitate that, we really need reusability. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you guys have seen some of our grasshopper videos. That was an early test bed that we were uh, operating in, in Central Texas at our test site there, where we're taking a first stage lifting off um, and, and having a precision landing. Um, we've also got some videos on our website that show the first stage from a real uh, orbital mission, a satellite delivery mission, uh, doing a near zero velocity landing in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, pretty cool stuff. It's, you know, it's not been done before. Um, and uh, hopefully in the next few months we'll be landing a stage instead of in the ocean because, you know, it falls over and then blows up um, and we want to get that hardware mm -hmm. back. So we're going to actually land it on a barge uh, in the near term, ultimately to land it back on land. Because if you don't have reusability, not only are rockets, uh, rocket flights and satellite delivery to orbit very expensive, but if you wanted to go to Mars, it's a one-way trip until you figure out how to build another rocket on Mars to come back. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, there are some people who are promoting kind of one-way trips that. to Mars. I've heard that. I've heard that's that. not our that's not our focus or vision. We definitely want uh, folks to be able to come back if they get to Mars and realize it's not the place for them. Yeah. By the way, the the return trip would be free because yeah. that stage has to come back so that we can get more people uh, for settling the planet. Um, so uh, yeah, reusability is super key. Uh, NASA just recently announced that SpaceX and Boeing uh, were the two companies that were going to move forward uh, with uh, uh, basically replacement of the shuttle mm -hmm. to carry our astronauts to the internet to low Earth orbit. I don't know if those of you that uh, are familiar with the industry or not, but uh, when the last shuttle launched, the U.S. lost its ability to carry its own astronauts. So right now we rely on the Russians to do that, which is really a sad mm -hmm sad, non-patriotic position to be in. So we're going to fix that. Good. What's the timeline for that? So we're going to fly humans in uh, late 16. OK. Early 17. Oh, that's great. Yep. OK. So now SpaceX is really doing rocket science. And so what do you guys do to help lighten up things at, around the office? You know, if, if nothing, well, I don't want to say if nothing else. One of the focuses that, that Elon, for sure, my boss, I have a boss, um, has is he, he definitely think, wants people to have fun at work. Um, we have great parties, um, but I, I would say in the last few years we've been so busy getting Falcon 9 established uh, in the world market and Dragon that we, we might have lost sight of trying to figure out how to make things fun, but we're in a much better place now and, uh, and we're thinking about some really cool things that we're going to do to the facilities uh, as we expand. Um, so it's, I'll leave it to uh, 
uh, I'll leave it there, but definitely fun things. And we're going to have another great Christmas party this year. Okay. Sounds good. Be like a small town. There's going to be like 8,000 of us. Yeah. Have you, is your company grown to that size? Do you think you'll have to be adding a lot more employees to handle the growth with all these new projects? Oh, there's no question. Yeah, hopefully we can add it at a slower rate, although yeah. if you go by percentage-wise, you're still adding more staff year over year than you were the year before. Um, uh, there's no question that we'll continue to grow. Okay. Yeah, Wonderful. but especially facilities-wise for anyone that's been at SpaceX and seen the factory, it's pretty tight. Yeah. Okay. So again, I just want to encourage everyone out there, if you have any questions for Gwen, to tweet. And I think Kelly has a few for us right now. Thank you. So from our audience, what do you do when someone asks you what is an engineer? Well, I always make the joke about the train, driving the train, um, just to show how far some folks are away from understanding what engineers, uh, what engineers do. But in, in the simplest form, engineers build and create things. I know, and I, I like when you, our sponsors bring videos to be able to see all the different technologies that they're working on. Um, we're all engineers in this room, and then if you looked at what Eaton's doing, what Genetech's mm -hmm. doing, and SpaceX, it's really, I mean, it's hard to say that engineers don't touch everything, so that's great. So SpaceX could be anywhere in the world. Why are you in Southern California? There was a huge uh, talent base of, uh, or a huge expertise in the aerospace industry. You know, we were a brand new company. You have to, you have to found it with, we were a brand new company. You had to found it with people that knew um, about the industry and about the technology and then and then as we felt comfortable with the space-based technology then you need to feel comfortable um, in new areas such as production uh, you know the aerospace industry at least at the at the highest levels you know a lot of rockets are not produced every year um, at least not in the United States and so the kind of the next growth area for us was becoming experts in in production mm -hmm. good I think this is a good question. What current lacking capabilities would you most like to see in new engineering graduates? What new capabilities? Mm -hmm. the, the, the piece that we most commonly look for is hands-on experience as an engineer. Um, so people that participated in great labs, solar car project, Formula SAE, or any other, you know, uh, robotics, first robotics, mm -hmm. um, or whatever robotics competitions. We like to see people participate in design, build, fly um, activities as well as competitions, because then you know who's really great. Yeah. The winners. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Makes recruiting pretty easy. I want to go after that team yeah. from that school, because they won. But I mean, that's good advice, because I think, especially for the collegiates in the room, you get so focused in the classes that you're in. But I think the advice you just gave is, how do you work well in a team? How are you communicating well? And if you're doing that, then you'll see the success. And then those are the type of employees you'd like to bring on. Absolutely. So that's good. Yeah. Is there a time you felt defeated in, career, in your career, and how did you bounce back? Defeated. Uh, well, that's a really good question. I uh, defeated in my career. You know, maybe we'd have to solicit feedback from former colleagues <laughs> and supervisors. Yeah. Did I ever yeah. really screw something up? Uh, probably. Um, but maybe, but then with just talking to you here, it sounds like your personality is very like you take maybe an obstacle, but you learn from it, and it's made you then pursue your, your career in new ways. So it's like that taking the risk. There, there's no question like that, that yeah. if, if you want to be better every day, you have to learn from the mistakes that you make yeah. every day. Um, I, I can talk about like the, one of the most difficult periods of time uh, in, in, uh, in my career, and that was uh, kind of like 2008, 2009 timeframe at SpaceX. We were, um, uh, you know, we, we struggled getting our first product, Falcon 1, to orbit. Um, and, uh, and yet we were growing very rapidly. We, had, uh, we were working on the larger vehicle, Falcon 9 and, and Dragon, and it was you know, exhausting our resources. And, and there were a couple of times in that period when um, you know, I was looking at the finances and thinking, I don't, I don't know how I'm gonna make payroll in six weeks. Um, and so those are really hard times. Yeah. You, know, you, get, you get pretty stressed out when you've got you know, a thousand people that are depending on you to make sure you can pay them. Uh, and I never missed a payroll. So luckily, um, we were able to overcome some of those challenging times. But you know, that makes the company stronger. Yeah. 
Yeah, it makes you better. Yeah. And that this kind of follows on to that. So how do you foster innovation without sacrificing the bottom line? So our bottom line fundamentally depends on in innovation. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, innovation is key to uh, us continually improving our products. You know, we don't want the, the launch vehicle to be static. We want our launch services to be more reliable uh, year over year, which means you're innovating. Um, you're finding the weak links and you're fixing them. Um, so innovation is absolutely encouraged. I, I, I can't imagine anyone at SpaceX not understanding that we need to do better mm -hmm. every day, and that means processes on the production floor and, um, and designs need to be better every day. The stuff that gets in the way of innovation occurs as you grow. Like mm -hmm. I talked about earlier, you know, bureaucracy sets in and, and trust, uh, making sure everybody does what they're supposed to do and um, kind of that lack of connection to the vision. So, but I'm pretty sure that everybody knows that, uh, that innovation is key at SpaceX. As a matter of fact, our most recent performance reviews, one of the key uh, features that we were looking for and, uh, and assessing folks on was their, their uh, ability to innovate and their demonstrated ability to innovate. Okay. And you guys are successful at it, so that's good. Can always do better. Yeah. So what advice do you have for collegiates entering the workforce? Well, if you're just entering, um, I would say I'd love to get people earlier than, than that, and that is you really, if you want to be an engineer, if you're an engineer, classes are great to give you foundational um, knowledge, but it doesn't give you great experience. So please go do co-op programs, do internship programs, do, do these design build fly competitions. Um, if you had not done that and you're entering the workforce, um, you certainly want to get associated with projects uh, in, your, in your career where you do get to do hands-on engineering. Um, I left my first job at Chrysler Motors uh, because I was, you know, I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed mechanical engineer. I wanted to engineer, and I was dissatisfied with the engineering that they did there. They, they fundamentally turned brand new engineers into project managers and hired out a lot of the technology overseas. And, that was very unsatisfying to me. I think you, you want to learn the fundamentals and the basics. So you really want to get your hands on real projects. Okay. And now I'm going to be a little selfish. What advice do you have for mid-career women who might have young children that are staying in the engineering workforce and want to continue their career forward? So there is no question that balancing uh, a difficult career and raising children is probably the, the most difficult challenge that women uh, face, actually. Um, I was lucky, I was able to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, it's not a secret, I, my, the father of my children I'm, I'm divorced from, and so I was a part-time mom. I got my kids for a week and then they'd go to their father for a week, and so I was able to plan my trips away uh, during uh, when they were with their dad which was enormously helpful for my career. That's, I'm not recommending that, by the way. <laughs> that shouldn't be the strategy. My husband would like that yeah. advice. <laughs> Don't make that a strategy, although you know yeah. you can make yeah. lemons, or you can make lemonade out of the lemons. Yeah. Um, for sure you want to stick with it. You know, it, it, family has to come first. You, you know, you, you don't want to raise uh, children who are, are not going to make the world a better place. So they need you, they need mm -hmm. you. But I think you can find creative ways of, of managing, you know, I had, um, I wasn't even wealthy at the time, was, I mean, you know, I had a nanny uh, when my kids were little, and um, one of the things that was so great about that is she was objective, like parents aren't objective mm -hmm. about raising their children, I'm not, you know, you're total wimps, you know, they're so oh, cute, of course you're going to get what you want. <laughs> You know, and, and this woman didn't let my kids get away with anything. And, and I think fundamentally one of the reasons why they're such awesome kids is because they had that really objective but still yeah, loving right. background. And it doesn't have to be in a nanny, but you certainly want to find a place where you can uh, place your kids where they're going to feel loved, but they're also going to be treated very objectively. Um, I do hope that uh, better daycare systems uh, mm -hmm. are going to proliferate. Uh, it's certainly something that I'm focused on. Um, hopefully more companies look at solid uh, daycare for their um, employees' children. Um, you, the hardest thing to do is to leave your kids at a place where you're unsure mm -hmm. about, uh, about how they're going to be taken care of. Then you actually don't leave them there. You take them home and figure something else out. Um, 
So it, it is the hardest challenge. I, I would just recommend being as creative as you can. Um, find great people and supportive people who can help you uh, while you're doing that. But don't, I, I wouldn't give up the career. It's really good advice, you know, and within our organization, um, we like to use the term success on your own terms. And I've kind of resonated with that because one size doesn't fit all. And we have a lot of amazing women out there that have done amazing things with their career, balancing work-life integration, whether that means with children or without, mm -hmm. uh, whether they choose to stay home for a few years and then re-enter the workforce. So I think uh, we have a lot of great um, role models in this organization to kind of help with that as well. So. So what inspires you today, and how do you inspire others that you're leading? You know, I don't know how I inspire others. I, hopefully it's, you know, a, a very strong work ethic. I, I think folks that work at SpaceX know that, uh, that Elon and I are super focused and dedicated on, uh, on doing the right things and, and doing great things, and, and hopefully that's motivational for folks. Hopefully my employees know that uh, they're the most important part of the company. I know a lot of people say that, but I think at SpaceX it's absolutely the case. We would never be where we are today without the extraordinary people uh, that do what they do every day. Um, so what inspires me? You know, I, uh, I, I'm, I love uh, historical, I love history actually. Had I not been an engineer, I, I would have gotten a degree in history. I don't know what I would have done with it, um, but, uh, but I, I loved history. and. I think it's really, it's motivational for me to think that I'm a part of the future um, exploration of, of another place. Like I'm really focused on the time when, when Western Europe expanded into the Americas and I, I really am compelled to be part of the team that's gonna you know, expand beyond Earth boundaries. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, my favorite shows are Battlestar Galactica, the new one, <laughs> and Firefly. And, uh, you know, all right, yeah, let's yeah. go there. <laughs> um, and I, it's, I can't believe we can't do that right now. No. I, we have to be able to do that, you know, right? We have to fly to other galaxies or yeah. and leave learn. the solar yeah. system. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good. So your boss is in the, on TV a lot. Is he a hands-on boss, or is he kind of gives you? He's right very hands-on, actually. He's, uh, I, I love working for Elon. Yeah. He's extraordinary. He, you know, he doesn't have to say anything. You just want to do awesome work and excellent work. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to say, you screwed it up. You got to go yeah. fix it. You know, I, you know, I'm motivated to do a good job. He's an extraordinary leader. He's done, you know, he takes on industry. <laughs> so he, he takes on the aerospace industry the banking industry with PayPal, the automotive industry with Tesla, the energy industry with Solar City. I mean, this man, you know, is kind of unstoppable, and I, I really think that he is, uh, you know, I think he's the, the greatest innovator ever, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. That and he's not paying me to say that. He's probably <laughs> super embarrassed that I am. Yeah. It's inspiring to see all the yeah. different things that he's done. Yeah. So, yes. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. So how can young women in engineering develop creative and innovative work habits? That's, that's a good question because think of our classes. They're not, I mean, they try to teach you how to be innovative, but I think they're also trying to teach you the fundamentals. So there's that fine line of, of the classes you're taking versus how are you gonna be innovative at work and creative. There's, there's a lot of ways of looking at innovation, um, leveraging great ideas from other industries you know, uh, is, is innovating, you know, bringing production methodologies to, you know, kind of a, a, a build one at a time. Aerospace industry was, was innovative. Uh, we, uh, uh, I, re I remember when we were looking at the payload air conditioning system for our fairing, sorry, this is a little, little technical. Fairing is the clamshell that sits around the satellite that protects it from the heating during ascent. Um, and uh, traditional, uh, air conditioning systems at launch sites and fairings, you know, millions of dollars. And uh, we were looking at putting one in at the Cape, at our launch site at the Cape, and it was, you know, the price projected looked like it was a million and a half dollars. And I had just finished putting in a new air conditioning system in my house, <laughs> you know, and like, it wasn't a million and a half dollars to put in air conditioning in my house. Why the heck is it so expensive? And so we, we you know, we looked at 
non-traditional ways of providing air conditioning um, you know, outside of the industry. So, so leverage other industries, like who does that thing the best, even if it sounds crazy, like air conditioning from home or industry as opposed to air conditioning from aerospace. Um, and, uh, and also, if, you, if you're thinking about how are you going to do things better, mm -hmm. you know, you, it's, it's, that is innovative, right? You have to do things better than you did today. You've got to think about how you did it. You've got to think about how you could do it better. And it really drives this mindset of, of being better and innovating. Mm -hmm. So a lot of companies have processes in place. So do you think that SpaceX has a process for this innovation? Or are you just encouraging your employees to... Just think all the time, how am I going to make this better? What would I do differently? I think we just encourage the mindset. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, on the development side, you know, we have, we're, we're continually developing and we're also rolling out product from a production perspective. And those are two very different mindsets. One is speed to, like on the technology, the innovation side, you want to get there fastest. And, it, and if it doesn't work exactly right, it's OK the first time because you're, you're trying to spin, spin the design. Whereas on the production side, you want to make sure that you do it right and, and the same every time. So we are balancing those two cultures at SpaceX. Um, and I think on the, on the development side, we're encouraging people, like, if there is process, get rid of it. You know, just go. Go fast. And if you find obstacles and stumbling blocks, then send us an email and we'll get rid of it. Okay. The speed, to, speed to get to where you're going on the innovation side and on the development side is what's key. Do you think that's how you keep your employees engaged because of that speed in this culture? Or do you have to do other things to make sure they're engaged and, and want to reach the goals that you have for your company? You, it, you know, I, I think we should ask my, my team yeah. more. Um, they would know better than I. It, one of the things that I think makes it easier to be engaged at SpaceX is everybody knows what we're trying to do. Everybody at the company knows what we're trying to do, and so you can feel kind of a part of, of that as opposed to, I don't know, being just a cog in a giant machine. Um, I think hopefully people, well, people should know what we're doing. We're super clear about it. Elon's very clear about it when he meets with employees. Okay. You know, we're trying to get to Mars. It's really hard. Yeah. And, and soon, you know, we're not talking about getting to Mars in a century. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we'd, we'd like to build the capability so that anybody in this room uh, could, uh, could sell your house, pack your bags, and go to Mars. Go to Mars. And do it cost effectively. Yep. I mean, that's a, that's a balance, too, that you always have to look at. Yep. So. so you've been very successful in your career. So what has inspired you to climb the ladder instead of just staying an individual contributor? You know, I, I actually got this, asked this question yesterday at the intern. Um, I never had a plan, you know. I don't know if that's like a big revelation or not. I never had a plan, but I always wanted to do new things. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, so I was always seeking uh, kind of new opportunities and new challenges, and I think that just kind of led me to this place. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, when I became an engineer, you know, at Chrysler Motors, I never said, you know, I want to be president of a company. I, it, I just wanted to be a great engineer. And do you think you've been able to succeed because you did not have that plan? I mean, as engineers, we like plans. We like to, you know, have this is what I'm going to do, and this is my career path. Do you think, since you've been so open with it, that that's brought the success you've had? I think it probably allowed me to take a challenge on that I might not otherwise have taken. Mm -hmm. You know, like leaving, uh, leaving a job and going and working for a startup rocket company. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I had had a plan, that probably wouldn't have been part, part of the of it, plan, right. Right? right? And so maybe that would have prevented me from taking mm -hmm. that, uh, that leap, which obviously would have been a huge mistake. How did they find you? Uh, so a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Hans Konigsmann, who was uh, his vice president of mission assurance right now at SpaceX, we worked together at a little company called Microcosm, and he met Elon at uh, an amateur rocket event in the Mojave Desert. Mm -hmm. And so I was, uh, so he left, he came to SpaceX. I was still at Microcosm, but I took him out to lunch as a kind of a congratulatory. And as I dropped him off at the SpaceX facility, I, he brought me into the cube area. You know, there were like five <laughs> people there. And I ran into Elon, and I, right. uh, and I shook his hand, and I said, you know, I think you need a, you need a new salesperson. You need a salesperson. And uh, later that afternoon, I got a call from his assistant saying, well, he wants you to apply for the new vice president of sales. That was pretty quick. Yeah, I wasn't looking for a job, Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's great. 
So I think this might be easier in um, a smaller startup company, but a lot of, um, of us in, in larger companies hear the advice that to be successful leaders, you should um, work in different areas of the company. Do you have advice on that? And I'm, versus the stair-step way, how do you take lateral moves and still feel like you're progressing your career? So there is no question that I, first of all, I think to be a good leader in an area, you have to be, you have to know what goes on in that area at a pretty intimate level of detail. You don't have to be the expert, but you have to be expert enough that the, the folks that will be supporting you will respect you mm -hmm. um, for your ability to make good decisions for that particular group. Um, and then obviously if, if you want to, instead of manage, you know, a thermal analysis team, if you want to manage a rocket team, you want to understand propulsion and you want to understand structures and avionics as well. So I think it's, I think it's really important uh, to move laterally in your career and gain uh, deeper insight into kind of parallel areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important. But you've, you've spent your career in aerospace. Well, I guess you said you started in automotive and then moved into aerospace, but you've spent the majority of your career in just one industry. Correct. Okay. I, but I started in the thermal area. I was a thermal analyst, a thermal weenie, uh, for those of you that know the, know the field. And then I expanded um, into more broad mechanical areas. So then my responsibility was both thermal uh, and structures and integration and launch. Um, and then, uh, then from there, I, I did kind of focus more in launch at aerospace. Um, but I started leading teams of okay. people at that time. So even if it's not a specific technical area, if it's a, kind of a new programmatic area, or if you take on leadership and teams, you're mm -hmm. still kind of learning a new thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's the wonderful thing about engineering. Like when you guys go to the career fair today, it's really impressive to see the breadth of companies we have here that are looking for the engineering talent and just the way that we're able to use our skill set in a lot of different areas, so that's good. So this question, I might change up both the words a little bit. It says, in your various roles as mother, wife, and employee, it says, do you ever feel, and I'm going to say when you feel, overwhelmed, how do you manage? <laughs> yeah, I feel overwhelmed a couple times a day. Um, you know, I, I think you, then you go back to your engineering roots, and every problem uh, can be solved to, to one extent or another um, by kind of breaking it apart and looking at its fundamental components and solving each piece uh, of the problem. Um, doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get to an optimized solution, but that's really the way I, I, I operate, is I try to break you know, what seems to be overwhelming down into smaller pieces that I can get through mm -hmm. and accomplish. Okay. There's a commercial on TV that I find funny right now, is there's little children and they're saying, you're leaving vacation days unused. How is this possible? Do you use your vacation? Um, <laughs> well, it depends on how you define vacation, right? Um, so uh, SpaceX has a, a, a policy that w we certainly want you to take at least a week of vacation. Um, and if you don't end up taking vacation, you, could, you can cash that out at the end of the year. Um, but we, we won't let you cash all of it out. You have to take some. Um, but vacation, you know, I, I, my anniversary was last Friday and we took the day off and, okay. you know, when my husband wasn't looking, I was doing my emails on my iPhone and <laughs> <laughs> you can always sneak in connectivity. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think, have I like fully vacated probably 24 or 40, like two days in a row. Mm -hmm. I could probably okay. leave for two days in a row. Well, I mean, they, they laugh, but I personally look at the virtual environment oh. we work in. Everything's 24-7. Yep. But then that also gives you the ability to flex. Yep. You know, you can come in early if you need to go out in the afternoon to do, like, a s project with your, your children. Or if you have something to do, you know, like you said, you took Friday off. But maybe on Sunday afternoon, you're like, well, I have a few down hours. I'm going to make sure that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I, there's pros and cons to it. And it's, you're right. I think you're... You're handling it well with yeah. the way you're able to flex. Yeah, there's there's no question that ha if if you have a, a job where you must be in plant specific times, mm -hmm. that's a much greater challenge uh, than having flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I leave the office uh, on the weeks that I have my kids. I leave the office at six, 
so that I can cook dinner for them and we chat a little bit and then they, you know, my son goes and does his homework. My daughter's at university now, so she's she's on her own. Um, he goes and does his homework and I can get back to work or, you know, do whatever I need to do. Um, so certainly, or companies that allow kind of space flexibility uh, in your career is, is, is a, I think for mothers especially, you should, you should search out those kinds of companies that will allow you to work from home. Yeah. I've had a flexible schedule since having children and guarantee that's the reason why I yep. still work. Yep. So Super I know key. It is. Yep. It's yep. very important. Did your kids get the engineering bug? So, yeah. Um, they're two very different children. My daughter, uh, she's at Stanford right now, doing great. Yay. She's so great. Um, so she wanted to be a lawyer. Do we have any lawyers in the house? No. no. Yay. <laughs> she wanted to be a lawyer and, you know, my father was a physician and so physicians' families, you know, don't groove with lawyers' families. Um, so when she said lawyer, I thought, oh, wow, what do we do? So I, uh, I hazed her. I made her intern at SpaceX as a paralegal. I didn't pay her. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and she left that summer saying, you know, I think I want to be an engineer. I was like, yeah. Yes. So great. Yeah. Yes. And mechanical engineer, too. Really? So, you know, I put her in a really good spot, you know, yeah. around <laughs> social engineers so that they would, like, chat with her. Yeah. And, and she was really excited about it. Uh, you know, and my son, who is also an extraordinary student, he's just a senior this year, um, I think he'll be an architectural engineer. Okay. He is, um, he's actually more creative than my daughter. He, he, when he was little, um, after he got over the I want to be a garbage man, um, yeah. he's like when he was three or whatever, then he, he wanted to be an inventor. I was so Very excited cool. about Very that. Cool. You know, yay, be an inventor. Um, so I think he'll end up as an architectural engineer. He's certainly yeah. pursuing an engineering career. He's yeah. just not, he's not exactly sure yet. Right. I thought he'd be a, a software engineer. I mean, the guy is a video gamer extraordinaire. He can yeah. kill anybody on the internet in 30 seconds. <laughs> it's impressive. Do they have better uh, technology skills than you, or do you think you still have the edge? Well, I can't even turn my TV set on, so, um, <laughs> but that's a piece of electronics, and I'm a mechanical yeah. engineer. But uh, yeah, my husband and my son have it set up so that you need to push a different button on like five different remotes. Yeah. I'm just like, screw it. You know, I'll watch from my laptop on Netflix. That I yeah. do. I have complete control over that. Um, no, I think they'll probably yeah. kick my ass. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Was there a time with SpaceX where you questioned the decision to go there? Never. No. Okay. Never. That's good. Mm -mm. Never. And what was the biggest career risk that you've taken? I think coming to SpaceX. Yeah. Um, yeah. Startup rocket companies had not had success, not one, uh, at the time. Um, Elon had no experience in the industry. He had obviously a, a chain of successes, but you know everybody thinks their industry is special, and and I was you know I was worried about it. Are we? Is he going to finance the company far enough to the point where I feel like we can convince people that we're going to do what we're going to do? Um, and uh, so it looked, it looked very risky mm -hmm. at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, other than having my children and, and marrying my husband, it was the greatest decision of my life. That's good. How long are you typically in a role when you're in a startup company? Uh, oh, in, uh, typical in startup? I think people in startups probably, if, uh, if you stay with a company, you probably stay in roles longer. Before SpaceX, I would change jobs even if I stayed at the same company every two or two and a half years, mm -hmm. you know, I got kind of bored and moved on. Um, at SpaceX, I was chief of sales from 2002 to 2008, mm -hmm. which is a long time. And then, uh, and I've been president since 2008. So okay. these are the longest I've stayed in jobs. In jobs. Yeah. Okay. Not bored. <laughs> Not bored. That's good. Do you have to travel a lot? I travel a lot. Yeah. And you're still able to plan your trips around? Not anymore. Not anymore. No. They don't really need me they anymore, need right? You know, right. my son actually likes to stay home by himself. Yeah. I'm sh and he's not, you know, it's not like he's having a party when we're gone, but oh. uh, he's very independent. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure he's not, really. <laughs> really. 
Well, that's all the questions that I have. Was there anything else that you want, or does you have more, Kelly? Okay, we have a few more. Thank you. Those are good questions. Do you think you've had to sacrifice anything in your career because of parenthood? I don't think so. No, I, uh, or at least I can't think. I can't think, think of anything. But again, I'm. You know, I, I said earlier, I'm. I'm not a regretter. I, um, no, I wouldn't. I would. I can't think of any yeah. decision that I would have made. That's big good. decision that That's I would have made differently. No, I don't Very think good. I did. That's good. And then, as a leader and at SpaceX, do you have an intentional focus on gender equality? So. Our focus at SpaceX is to hire and, and promote or promulgate excellence. Uh, and we are, we're actually the only company that I've ever worked for or known of that is completely blind to sex, religion, color. I mean, we are absolutely blind. All we care about is, is performance and excellence. Um, However, our numbers, our, our percentages are not great. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so we've started focusing more on, um, on trying to make, that, uh, make, those, make those numbers better. Um, so it's, it's relatively new. Mm -hmm. You know, we had our heads down trying to get rockets to orbit, trying to get satellites um, flying, trying to get Dragon to the space station. Um, you know, and, and now is definitely the time to go fix that. Mm -hmm. It needs to be fixed. So if you're awesome, and you want to help go to Mars, you need to go by our booth and drop off your resume and come work at SpaceX. Very good. <laughs> well, and I think being such an innovative company, you know, that diversity of thought will be, you know, imperative to be able to meet the timelines you guys have and to meet the vision that you have. So that's, that's good to yeah, hear. Yeah, women are critical uh, in, in resolving problems. Women approach problems differently. Uh, women tend to be much more collaborative. Uh, and you rarely find individual engineers, um, you know, you certainly don't find individual engineers building rockets anymore. It's a collaborative kind of team mm -hmm. effort. And, uh, and women are great at that. So there's no question that we'll do better mm -hmm. by, uh, we will be better served by increasing the number of women we have at the company. Mm -hmm. And so you said for your career that you really didn't have like a path. You just, you know, have gone with it. So how do you respond to the question, where do you want, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, five years. So I can't imagine like ever cutting the cord with SpaceX, right? It's a, you know, it's an extraordinary habit. Um, but uh, as far as, I do strongly believe that, uh, that the educational system in the United States needs to get addressed. I think, I think things are changing. However, um, I, I think children learn, children are individuals and they learn in very different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think our approach to educating is, uh, is a poor way to educate, you know, and, and you have to believe me because our, our scores are dismal. Um, you know, we're barely first world ranked, uh, certainly in science and math. As a matter of fact, this year I think we fell in the ratings. I think we're number 31. Mm -hmm. Um, for those that, uh, that, that bother to take the, the test. So um, I, uh, I definitely want to start focusing uh, on uh, trying to fix education. And, uh, and obviously, I, I think the world should be full of engineers, so I want to focus on getting more people to Into be engineers. That pipeline. Yes, that's good to hear. So this is going back to when you were a collegiate, and I should have asked this earlier, but was there ever a reason that you thought you might not pursue engineering? And did you have to overcome a challenge in your engineering education? I'm a pretty stubborn person, you know, and, and when I, at 15, I said I'll be an engineer. I, I think not being an engineer, I would have looked on as being kind of a failure. Yeah. Um, so I don't think I ever really thought about leaving engineering. I, I don't remember that. It was mm -hmm. a long time ago, by the way. i will be 51 in a month. Um, but I do recall very clearly when I took that class, that I, the rigid body dynamics class, that I, it clicked for me. And, and, I, and then I knew, knew, knew that I was gonna be okay in this mm -hmm. field, as opposed to always kind of feeling like it was this uphill battle. Um, so 
No, I don't remember having any doubts about it, but I do remember that seminal moment when yeah. I when I got it, mm -hmm. which was I was super excited about it. I think I was I was nine when I decided I was going to be an aerospace engineer. And so I how kind, did you know? I had a lunchbox. You had a lunchbox. Yeah. Was it a Star Trek lunchbox? It was a young astronaut lunchbox. And so so I, did, did you I, want to be an astronaut? I did, and I pursued aerospace engineering, not knowing a clue what I was going to do, except that. that going to go be an astronaut. Um, but I kind of had that, that feeling too, like if I decide to change my mind, that's going to be a failure. And, you know, and so I went to Iowa State University, and it was challenging, and it was very hard. But somehow, failure was not an option. Right. It wasn't something I was going to do. So yeah. as challenging as it was, it was somehow I had the you know, audacity to say, I'm going to get through it. So I don't know. So SpaceX is definitely innovative, but we've kind of talked about this. What are you going to do to change that diversity to be more innovative? Oh, to be more innovative? Um, I, think, I think we need to kind of further promote at the company that uh, we have to do things better and differently, and we have to continually improve the product. So, uh, and we want we need to make sure that the bureaucracy does not slow us down in, in those arenas mm -hmm. and that the kind of the two fundamental and equally important elements of our company you know the production the reliable the you know rolling out product for our customers versus the innovative kind of quick paced it's okay to fail philosophies that that we can can stay a tight company uh, with maintaining both of those and each feeling equally important mm -hmm. because they are they equally are. important. Right. Yeah. Um, yes. What, did I, no, I'm that's not, fine. Did I answer the no, question? You I think did. I forgot. This, this, this is a better question. What's the best advice you got from your mom? Be an engineer. <laughs> Why Most do you definitely. think, as you said, her background was art? Why do you think she wanted you to be an engineer? Do you think she saw the growth in that industry, or she thought that's something you would be able to succeed at? You know, I, I don't know. She, she passed away a year ago, so mm -hmm. I, I never got around to asking her. I did thank her mm -hmm. uh, for, for pushing me in that direction. I was not excited about it when she first brought it up. I was, you know, I was not a great teenager. I was pretty ornery and horrifying. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and when she first said engineering, I was like, you know, what are you talking about, you crazy lady? Um, but uh, I think she recognized. Actually, when I was in third grade, uh, I remember driving home, and uh, we live way out in the boonies from Libertyville, Illinois, which in itself is the boonies. Um, so I was always in the car, and uh, I remember trying to figure out like, how does a car engine work? You know, I know we're going this way, but I thought the car engine spun that way. And, and I asked her, I said, you know, how does an engine work? And she was like, I don't know. So she gave me a book, and I read the book okay. in third grade. Um, so I think she probably saw that I was kind of connected to how things work and just promoted it. You know, it was, I was very lucky. It was not her field at all. She was, uh, yeah, she was an artist and a uh, very creative person. Mm -hmm. um, I am not a creative person. Like, my sister is a photographer, and my older sister, and she's a uh, producer, um, documentary producer, and you know she'll take a photo. I took a photography class in undergrad, and uh, we went on a photo shoot in, in the city of Chicago. You know, we took the same photo. Was, she was standing there, I was standing here. It's the same tree, and uh, and my photo looked like an engineer taking a picture of a tree, and hers <laughs> was a piece of art. It's like, oh, my God, it was a beautiful photo. So uh, yeah, I don't I don't yeah, have that don't have that either. talent at all. It was really it very clear. Yeah. Doctor, brain surgeon, dad, engineering, Gwen, artist, mother, very creative sisters. Have you ever been on Pinterest? Pinterest? Yeah. No, you know, I haven't even. No. I don't go there. Is that a creative? <laughs> it's very creative. Okay. I don't go there. It's not me. It's um, not a shopping site. I don't. No. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's a shopping site. It's not. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, and I, I shouldn't talk. I really don't know what it is. But people get ideas for style and things and creativity. So you know we have to go look at it now, <laughs> like, right? Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned you went to a Society of Women Engineers panel, and yep. you like the woman's suit. Yes. So I have the question, where did you get your suit? 
<laughs> oh, yeah. Um, where did I get this? This actually isn't a suit. They're separates. They're theory. I don't know if you guys shop theory. They have fabulous women's suiting separates. This is actually a tuxedo jacket. I just, I got it, I don't know, a couple months ago. I don't, I don't remember where. Do you only shop online? I shop a lot online. Um, you know, I used to shop at Lowman's. They have, if you're willing to dig through the racks and through like all the nasty stuff, you can find some fabulous things. But it, uh, it closed up in my area. I live down in the South Bay. Yeah. So um, I do shop online for shoes. Zappos, awesome. Um, yeah. It's neat to see how that technology has worked out too, because like, I mean, 20 years ago, you wouldn't even go online, and now I do all my shopping right. online to just think, like, and what's five years going to be, and how we're all doing that. Yeah. Will there be brick and mortar stores the way they are now? Yeah. So, um, okay, back to back to work questions. <laughs> how do you find good suppliers? Interesting. So we are a very vertically integrated company, meaning we build a lot of our own componentry. As a matter of fact, the vast majority. Um, doesn't mean we don't have suppliers, but they're at a pretty low level of integration, like wire, raw materials, connectors. Um, but we build our own avionics. As a matter of fact, I know I've got a bunch of avionics women at the, the table there. Um, I also have some supplier engineers there as well. Um, so wh what do we look for the, and how do we, I, I would say we trial and error our suppliers, um, at least initially. Uh, for, for those suppliers that can keep up with us, we're very demanding. Um, it's, you know, it's never fast enough, it's never good enough, and it's never cheap enough. So, um, you know, there's been a number of long-term suppliers that, that they've stuck with us, and they've That's done good. a really great job. Okay. And then how do you dig into technical details of a project when there's administrative fires going on all around? <laughs> Yeah, so I actually don't get to do as much engineering as I would like. Mm -hmm. I'm happier when I'm working on engineering projects, but, but I do insert myself in um, engineering activities. Um, Elon is more, you know, when Elon asked me to be president, uh, we, we wanted to divide, divide up the roles. So, I mean, obviously he's chairman, he's CEO, he's chief designer, he gets to do what he wants, he's the boss. Um, but uh, he definitely focuses more on the innovation and the development side, and I focus more on the day-to-day -day operations okay. piece. Um, so what was the question again? <laughs> oh, how when do you, you focus on engineering while when you you're... have all that other... Yeah, it's funny. I, I day -day often day refer fires. to myself as the president of parking and potties because... Uh, <laughs> You know, when you grow that fast, yeah. uh, you, you run out of parking. Well, we've been out of parking for a year and a half. We're, we're just about ready to start breaking ground on a new parking structure across. Parking is a huge problem for us. We're in a, a very industrial area with no parking. Uh, so we bought a lot across the street, and we've been battling with Southern California Edison to allow us to build that parking structure. So we're actually going to start building the parking structure. And then potties. You know, you grow 50% a year, you run out of stalls. Yeah. <laughs> So you're like ripping out conference rooms and trying to get stalls put in, and it's and people are angry, and they people are angry. <laughs> yep. Okay, I'll take them, Kelly. Okay. So this is how can I get a job at SpaceX? So we've got a booth. <laughs> um, it's over in the hall. I need you to bring your resume, and if for whatever reason you can't find the booth, email me, Gwyn, G-W-Y-N-N-E, -N -N -E, at SpaceX.com. Very nice. Yep. So now I want to take the opportunity for those that don't know how to tweet. If you have a question in the audience, if you raise your hand, I know we have a few mics, and we'll take that for the next five minutes. And I'm sorry I can't see with these lights. So. I know I can't. Okay. <laughs> so just shout. Don't be shy, I don't bite. Shy, maybe. Hello. Hello. Hi. My name's Anna. <laughs> um, I guess, as, hi. This is uh, a question for Gwen. Um, how do you define leadership? Bringing along a team of people who do great things. It's that easy. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, can I go? Yes, please? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Anna, and I wanted to know, um, based on your experience in the past, like how would you say, as a collegiate member who is looking to get into the workforce, how can we best prepare ourselves to be competitive against, I guess, our male counterparts when we get into the workforce? So I, I can certainly answer that question for SpaceX. We are an, uh, a company that's intensely focused on pretty hardcore engineering. So for sure, um, do well in classes um, and, uh, and participate in engineering activities, whether it's labs, design, build, fly competitions. Um, and, and if you're on a team, you know, a Formula SAE team or a Solar Card team, you know, drive that team to be excellent and win. Because, I mean, we do recruit heavily the winning teams in, in, in these organizations. Um, I don't think all engineering companies are as so supremely focused on, on the hardcore. I'm not saying that they aren't, but um, we are supremely focused on that. But the other things that you really want to make sure you can do um, as an engineer is, um, is you have to be able to communicate. Uh, and you have to be able to communicate in small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, as well as large groups. Um, I look at almost every day as a sales day, and I don't mean, you know, clicking a deal. Um, you, you'll find in a competitive environment, in a competitive world, that there's lots of great ideas, and, and you know, you want to win. You, hopefully, you believe your idea is the best, and so you need to be able to communicate uh, both uh, what, what you're promoting or what your idea is or what your method of solving the problem is, um, as well as convincing them that, uh, that it's the best way. Great. Gwen, Gwen, sorry. Uh, my name is Esther, and um, one thing within tech and also within business, we need more women at the top, and we need more women in COO, CEO positions. So do you have any advice for women who are you know, in the middle management, going to the leadership level, any skills to develop? Forbes released their most women powerful women in business list a few months ago, and the majority of women on the top were from technical fields and had technical backgrounds. So what are the things we need to think about to develop, to get to that next level, and to change that statistic of women in leadership, which is very similar to the statistic of women in engineering? So the most important thing you can do um, for your boss is to be part of solutions, not just identify problems. I mean, clearly identifying the problems is super key, but you know, if you, your bosses are busy. You're busy, your bosses are busy. If you can um, solve problems for them, then you will become indispensable. Um, so my recommendation is, you know, I said earlier, you should be excellent, you know, every day. Um, but you should, you know, you make yourself indispensable by doing great things for your company and solving problems, solving problems that your bosses have. Um, please don't feel like you're in a box. Uh, don't solve problems and, and stay uh, kind of within your, your area. Um, Cross-functional problems are the hardest to solve um, because they require communication. Um, and so in tech firms, I think the, the multidisciplinary issues are the hardest to, to get done. So kind of reach beyond your, your job scope, um, solve your boss's problem, become indispensable, be excellent. It's kind of hard to, to not make it if that's, your, if that's who you are. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Um, hi, Gwen. You mentioned the importance of uh, always being able to receive feedback in your career. Do you have any tips for how to uh, build that skill and to do that you know, gracefully and receive that feedback gracefully and use it? So, yes, that's a great question, actually. Um, and by the way, I don't, take great, I don't take feedback well from my husband. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'll take it from anyone else. Um, don't say a word when you get that feedback. Just shut up, you know, bite your, because the first thing that people do is they argue back. Like, but, I, you know, that, I did that because it's like, shut up. Take it, listen to what the person is saying. If you don't understand what they're saying, ask questions. I don't, I don't understand that. Could you give me an example? Um, but don't argue. I'll never forget, I, had, I was reviewing an employee, and I said, you know, I don't think you take feedback well, and so it's hard to coach you. Um, and the employee started arguing with me, and I was like, 
okay? <laughs> We're here where I'm saying we are, but, but, it's like, okay, yeah. forget it. That's a great way to end. Yep. So Gwen, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you again for your words and your insights and leadership. I think this was a great way to, to hear your career path and the advice you have for our members, you know, both collegiates and our professionals. So we appreciate what you were able to take time off today with us at WE14. Um, and I just want to uh, conclude our program and thank again our sponsors, the Eaton Corporation and Genetech. Um, I encourage all of you to enjoy the day and attend some sessions. Um, have fun, and then I'll, we'll be back here at 5 p.m right here in this ballroom for some music and the kickoff for the career fair. So enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. It's really fun.